Are you planning a trip to the Kalahari Transfrontier Park in Southern Africa, but you're unsure when to go, where to stay, and where exactly to look for animals? Well, stay tuned, because in this video, I share my top 10 tips for planning the perfect trip to the Kalahari. Hi, I'm Philia Stain and I'm the Safari Expert and thank you very much for tuning into this video. For those of you that are new to the channel, I basically cover everything Safari related. From awesome sightings to amazing places and trip reports, as well as camera gear reviews and tutorials. Now I know the Kalahari Trans Frontier Park extremely well. And in this video, I'm going to share with you my top 10 tips for planning the perfect trip to the park. And as always, I leave my best tip till last. So make sure you watch to the end of the video. The first few tips will focus on the planning part of things and the last few tips on game viewing specifically. But before we get to the tips, please make sure to subscribe to the channel and also check out the description below for any important links and information. Tip number one is a double whammy. Make sure that you go for long enough and don't hop around too much. One of the biggest mistakes that I see people make when they go to the Kalahari Trans Frontier Park is they go for way too short, usually for only a week. And then on top of that, they hop around from one camp to another every single night. So they'll start at Tuerafiren and then they'll drive up to Nossop and across to Mata Mata, back to Nossop, up to Grootkolk and maybe all the way down to Tuerafiren. And what that means is that they spend most of their time packing up their stuff and transferring to another camp. And that's usually over the worst part of the day, right in the middle of the day when it's very hot. And remember that it takes a long time to get from one camp to another in the Kalahari. Even though the distances are relatively small, it takes a long time because of the very bad road conditions. Something that I'll speak about in another tip. So what I recommend is that you go for a little bit longer, at least for 10 days, but preferably for two weeks. And then rather than staying one night, one night, one night, one night, rather stay a little bit longer at fewer camps. I typically spend three nights or so at Tuerafiren at the gate, which is really nice because you've got both the Nossop and the Arb riverbeds to drive up along. And then I'll choose one camp where I stay at least three nights somewhere along the Nossop riverbed, whether that be Roeputz, Nossop or Grootkolk. And then I'll spend at least three nights somewhere along the Arb riverbed. And that could be in Mata Mata, Kalahari Tented Camp or Irikarias. By spending more time in one camp rather than hopping around, you get a good idea of what game movements are like around that specific camp. And it also allows you to check out all the different water holes and to spend time with them at the best times of the day. Now the main reason why so many people hop around to so many different camps when they first visit the Kalahari is because they wait until the last minute before they make their booking. And that brings me to tip number two. Make sure that you book way in advance. The Kalahari Trans Frontier Park is extremely popular and as a result it fills up way in advance. So you've got to make sure that you book those camps that you really want to visit at least 11 months before you go to the park. And that's basically when bookings open. Especially if you're planning to visit some of those wilderness camps like Grootkolk, Irikarias and Kalahari Tented Camp. Now if you can't get space at those extremely popular camps, just make a booking over the period that you want to go at the main camps and then keep on checking for cancellations every day after that until space is free up. For some reason there are a lot of cancellations throughout the year, especially as you approach the actual travel time. Tip number three is to plan your trip carefully. Providing you can get accommodation, it's sometimes difficult to decide whether you're going to stay in the public camps like Tuerafir and Nossop and Mata Mata that has swimming pools, filling stations and even shops, or whether you're going to stay in the wilderness camps that are much smaller but don't have all those different facilities. Now the best way to make an educated decision is to have all the necessary information while you're busy doing the planning. And I can highly recommend this book called Kalahari Self Drive Roots roads and ratings. Now it's another excellent book by HPH Publishing and within it you'll find not only information about each and every camp but also about the routes and roads around those camps. And what they've done for Kalahari specifically is basically dedicate a few pages to every section of road between each and every waterhole. So by doing some reading up beforehand not only will you know what to expect to see at each and every waterhole but also what you're likely to find when you drive between them. If you want to order Kalahari Self Drive Roots, Roads and Ratings online, simply follow the link in the description. 
Once you've decided which camps you're gonna stay at, it's very important to consider what time of the year to go because the Kalahari Desert is a place of extremes. If you don't like the cold, avoid June, July, and August, which is midwinter, because the temperature can drop to minus 10 degrees Celsius, which is obviously extremely cold. The water freezes in the pipes, and if you try and clean your windscreen by spraying it early in the morning, the water will actually freeze on the glass. By August and September, the park gets extremely windy, so it gets very dusty this time of the year. But it does make for some very dramatic photographs, and it's also the time of the year that the Cape foxes, black-backed jackals, and bat-eared foxes have their pups. By October, it starts getting very hot. And this is also the time of the year that the skies get very dramatic as the clouds start rolling in. So if you love landscape photography, this is a great time of the year to go. It's not uncommon to see massive cloud formations and even lightning storms. But like I said, it starts getting extremely hot with daytime maximums easily exceeding 40 degrees Celsius. All these clouds obviously bring the rain. So from October, you can start expecting big downpours. And when this happens, it sometimes fills up the roads with water, which can make it a little bit tricky to get from point A to point B. But more importantly, it forms natural pools of water in the felt. And that means that the man-made water holes are not quite as productive as they are during the winter months. Animals can basically drink at any standing water that they find, rather than walking all the way to the water holes that so many visitors love to stake out. Rain typically falls sometime between October and March, and very often in very short spells of heavy rain. And when it does rain for a few weeks on end, it does transform the felt almost overnight, when little yellow devil's thorn flowers carpets the riverbeds and the dunes. Seeing the Kalahari Desert colorful like this is extremely lucky because you never really know when the rain's gonna fall. But to give yourself a chance to see it green like this, come in January or February. My favorite months though in the Kalahari Transfrontier Park is March and especially April and May because the park is still relatively green but also the temperatures are much more bearable. It's not quite as hot as it gets over midsummer and not yet quite as cold as it gets in midwinter. Tip number four, bring your own food. Even though there are shops in the three main camps, namely Tuerifiran, Mata Mata and Nosop, these shops are very small and stocks pretty limited, especially when it comes to fresh produce. Rather bring all your food along, or if you are gonna do your shopping en route, do so in Uppington, which is the last biggest town south of the main entry gate at Tuerifiran. It's about two and a half hours drive or 250 kilometers south of Tuerifiran. Right, let's move across to the game viewing tips. Tip number five, deflate your tires. The roads in the Kalahari Transfrontier Park are not nearly as good as you'll find in other parks in Southern Africa, like the Kruger National Park. They're extremely sandy and in some areas very corrugated. So it's very important that you deflate your tires when you enter the park. The park recommends that you take it all the way down to 1.5 bar, but typically I actually take it down even more to 1.2 bar. And that just means that you're gonna have a much more comfortable ride. Just remember to inflate your tires again to their normal tire pressure before you leave the park at the end of the trip. And you can do so at the filling stations at Tuerifiran or Mata Mata. Tip number six is the one that you've all been waiting for. Vary your game viewing strategy. When I'm in the park, I vary my game viewing strategy from day to day. The first strategy is basically to drive very slowly and really look very carefully in the camel thorn trees and between the calcrete rocks and the grasses on the side of the dunes and to try and spot animals that are well camouflaged. If you do this, you stand a good chance of finding rare animals like African wildcats, honey badgers, or spotted eagle owls. And there are a lot of even smaller creatures like whistling rats and mice and ground agamas that you'll spot as well if you drive nice and slowly. Not to mention all the birds that we typically drive past if we go too fast. Speaking of which, that's my second game viewing strategy. After a day of very slow driving, looking for all those camouflaged animals, I typically go then the next morning and I try and cover as much ground as possible as quickly as possible but obviously sticking to the speed limit in the park. What this allows me to do is to cover as many of these sections mentioned in this amazing book between those different water holes, and hopefully obviously bumping into something that's either in the road or at one of the water holes specifically. So if you drive a little bit faster, you could easily drive past five or six different water holes in one drive. Obviously on the way out, 
but also on the way back to camp. My third and final game viewing strategy is to choose one specific waterhole and to spend the whole morning or afternoon right there. I'll usually scope out the different waterholes when I use game viewing strategy number two where I cover some ground and then I'll go back to the ones that are nicely lit for photography either in the morning or in the afternoon. And remember, as is always the case in wildlife photography, patience is always rewarded. If you stay at the waterhole for long enough, something will show up especially if you go to the park during the drier months. Tip number seven, make sure that you carefully check the high areas. And by high areas, I basically mean the top of the dunes as well as the top of the calcrete ridges on either side of the riverbeds. Now this is a little bit more prominent in the Aub riverbed, which forms a little bit of a narrow gauntlet. And the reason why I say you should check these high areas is because all three big cat species, namely lions, leopards and cheetahs love spending time on top of these dunes and calcrete ridges because it gives them a beautiful vantage point from which to look down onto the riverbed where their prey species like springbok, hartebeest, gemsbok and wildebeest spend a lot of time. There are one or two nice little viewpoints along both riverbeds where you can drive to the top and look down to see exactly what these predators see when they spend time at the top. Tip number eight. Spend some time to take photographs in camp. There are lots of little animals and birds in camp that have become extremely habituated. So what I often do is I go and lie flat on my stomach close to where there's a tap that's got some dripping water into a bird bath or maybe close to some burrows of ground squirrels or meerkats. This gives you a chance to take some beautiful eye level photographs of animals that we usually drive past when we're out on a game drive. And just remember, you're not allowed to feed these animals to get them to come closer to you. In fact, it's not necessary at all, because like I said, they're already very relaxed around humans. Just make sure you find those one or two places where there's a lot of activity, be patient, and you'll get some great photographs as well. Tip number nine, explore the Botswana side. Now, when I talk about the Botswana side, I'm not talking about the wilderness routes or about Mabua Suhube that's really quite difficult to get to. I'm talking specifically about Roipitz and Polenswa camps along the Nosob riverbed. At both these places, there are a few exclusive unfenced wilderness campsites with wooden A-frames for some shade, as well as little shower cubicles where you can hang up a bucket shower and where there's also a long drop. This is ideal for people that just want to get away from those busy public campsites and that really want to experience the wild side of the Kalahari. And if you're looking for something that's still exclusive, but even more luxurious than the wilderness camps on the South African side, consider staying at the fully catered Tashebube Ruipitz Lodge or Tashebube Polenswa Lodge, which are situated next to the two respective campsites. Ruipitz Lodge consists of a series of wooden chalets with thatched roofs perched on top of a beautiful red sand dune, whereas Polenswa Lodge consists of safari tents overlooking the beautiful Polenswa Pan. Both camps have stunning and extremely comfortable common areas, as well as a fire pit in the sand, both with a beautiful view. And if I must be honest, this is arguably my favorite place in the entire Kalahari Transfrontier Park. Another big perk of staying at these two lodges is that you have the opportunity to book guided game drives. And that gives you a chance to drive a few of the concession roads on the Botswana side. And it's also one of the few ways to explore the Kalahari in an open game view, which really is very different from driving in your own closed vehicle. For those of you that have made it all the way to this point, here comes my top tip when it comes to planning your trip to the Kalahari Transfrontier Park. Tip number 10, don't only go for lions. There's no doubt that the Kalahari lions are some of the biggest and healthiest lions in the whole of Africa. And especially the males with their big black manes are beautiful to see. But if you go to the Kalahari specifically to see lions and lions only, you're probably going to be very disappointed because there aren't that many lions there. Their numbers are actually quite low and sometimes you've got to work very hard to find them. And if that's the case, you're just going to miss so many of the other amazing things that the Kalahari has to offer. Things like brown hyena, bat eared foxes, meerkats, African wildcats, not to mention an amazing variety of bird species. Go to the Kalahari to see those species that you've never seen before. And any of the big cats that you have seen before, like lions, leopards, and cheetah, is just a bonus. If you do that, I promise you, you're gonna enjoy your trip even more. And if you really do wanna see those Kalahari lions, it brings me all the way back to tip number one, 
give yourself more time. Go for two weeks or more and I can guarantee you, you'll have some amazing lion sightings. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end of this video. I really hope that these top 10 tips are gonna help you to plan the perfect trip to the Kalahari Transfrontier Park. And don't forget to go and check out Kalahari Self Drive routes, roads and ratings, and you can buy it online if you follow the link in the description. Also remember to subscribe to my channel and check out some of my other videos as well.